It's just a matter of time before they become soldiers and are weaponized, you know? In fact, look where we are. It's all in the name. What's another name for male honeybees like the ones in the book? Right, you got it. Drones. Better than food, man. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Better Than Food Book Reviews. I'm your host, Clifford Lee Sargent. Great to see you as always. Hope you're doing well. Get that coffee. Nice. Got something great for you today. Today is The Glass Bees by the German author Ernst Jünger, published in 1957. This was sent to me by my friend and patron Michael Brown. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate it. And thanks for your patience in me getting to it. I'm sponsored by the publisher NYRB in that they send me free books sometimes, but this was sent to me by him, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I love the cover on this one. Look at that. Translated by Louise Bogan and Elizabeth Mayer with an introduction by the science fiction author Bruce Sterling. Though it's taken me a while to get to this one, I've got to say, the relevance has just increased, given the nature of technology and artificial intelligence at the moment, its infiltration into daily life, and the ominous speculation about its consequences. This speculation conjures up the stuff of speculative fiction, and few writers, I've got to say, that I've read at least, have speculated about AI and the problems with its future as accurately as Ernst Jünger, and very few writers have had as much speculation about their true thoughts and motives as he. He's a very talked about figure, for good reason. Because the German author Ernst Jünger was a mysterious, complicated, contradictory figure. Politically unaffiliated, technically, in a time when it seemed you absolutely had to be. Unaffiliated, not entirely of course, but unaffiliated uh, personally. Apolitical, that is. Apolitical in his alliance. Of course this is only internally, because on the surface, he looked like a Nazi. Jünger was a soldier in World War I and a controversial German author of novels and diaries as well as treatises and essays on certain subjects. And the later period he had like On the Marble Cliffs, which was a big critique of fascism and um, uh, the, the, what, the Forest Passage, I think is another one, and, uh, and then this one, The Glass Bees. After the First World War, he studied botany and entomology, like the study of insects, eventually discovering insects and having at least one named after him. In World War II, he served as a captain in the Wehrmacht in occupied Paris. He was a mail censor. But he wasn't very good at it. He kind of, you know, let's just say that certain letters critical of those in power just kind of disappeared. And at, according to Wikipedia, an acceptable level of risk, he informed people of certain um, roundups. So he saved Jewish lives. Very much reminds me of Bogey in Casablanca. I stick my neck out for nobody. That was kind of his old MO. But when he could, at an acceptable level of risk, he did. Jünger was hanging out with the Parisian filmmaker Jean Cocteau in Paris. And this is from the Paris Review article below. There's a reason equipped by Jean Cocteau, not exactly exemplary in his own wartime behavior, regarding Jünger's conduct during these years and doers. Some people had dirty hands, some people had clean hands. But Jünger had no hands. He's apolitical. He's out of it. He's clandestine. He's going between the tribes, right? He was also courting a Jewish woman at the time. He was married, though. He also took acid in the 50s, like the 1950s, with his friend, the first man to synthesize it, uh, the Swiss chemist Albert Hoffman. And Jünger famously lived to be 102 years old, and he was still smoking. There's been so much written about this guy, it could fill a small library. Basically, everybody's been trying to figure out if he was a Nazi. And if so, how much? 60% Nazi? 80% Nazi? 35% Nazi? He was admired and courted by the Nazis, but rejected them, right? And then was disowned by the Nazis. Some say he paved the way for the Nazis with this nationalism, which was very, very prominent in the 20s when he was younger, post-World War I. Uh, those who would say that he did that would be uh, people such as Thomas Mann, the famous German author. But then he also knew people who were involved in an assassination attempt on Hitler, uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg and his circle. He was uh, uh, admired by them, and they tried to recruit him, actually, and uh, he declined. And that was uh, something that kind of haunted him it seems, for the rest of his life. And we'll talk about that with this book. The sheer nihilistic scale of the genocide and Nazi concentration in POW camps crystallized his despair as well as his conviction that more active resistance was pointless. I heard that he was uh, basically just like drinking wine and hanging out and mixing with the who's who of Paris at the time, Picasso, Jean Cocteau, the filmmaker. And uh, I believe all that's contained in this book, his diaries from that time, a German officer in occupied Paris. And uh, this looks to be an excellent book just to have that kind of insider information and uh, observation, as uh, the term has been used quite a bit regarding Jünger. He was very observant. Um, his perspective of the era, what he saw coming from World War I through World War II, 
and living through both is incredible. I mean, it's, he lived, he, this man saw an astounding amount of change of everything, right? So, you know, being inside and out. One thing is certain, on the inside, he was his own man. He managed to piss off and confuse both the right and the left. He was not a boring guy. The Glass Bees is a short, quiet, disturbing, speculative fiction, maybe science fiction novel published in 1957. This is of course after World War II, so this is his later period. And uh, this book is highly regarded um, for some very interesting reasons. It's about an ex-soldier, uh, a tank inspector named Captain Richards, who is down on his luck post-war. Um, we don't know anything about what exactly happened in the war he was in, but he saw some really messed up stuff. And now he's broke and trying to find a job to take care of himself and his wife, Teresa. A military connection from the past named Twinnings informs him of a clandestine position for one of the most famous men in the world, it seems. A fellow named Zapparoni, Giacomo Zapparoni, who has created this technological empire filled with humanoid machines, robots, automatons, that star in films and can be so lifelike one man fell in love with a female one and then killed himself when he found out she wasn't human. And they're not just humans. They're like, they're, they're insects or animals and strange made up creatures as well. It's like extremely complex, you know, machines of various size with all these little things inside them that were created by like the best artists, right? Who obsess over this kind of stuff and eventually go mad, it seems. The fellow who had this position previously has, uh, of course, disappeared without a trace and nobody knows where he is. Um, well, or they're not saying. It's just a matter of time before they become soldiers and are weaponized, you know? In fact, look where we are. It's all in the name. What's another name for male honeybees like the ones in the book? Right, you got it. Drones. Jünger had a whole opinion on uh, uh, the industrialization of war and warfare. It was a very negative one, of course. He's very Mishima, right? There's something very, very Mishima about him. Or Mishima was a very Ernst Jünger, right? Both of these guys were influenced by the French authors, the like French decadent authors. Both of them really, really championed the narrative, the, the, the archetype of the warrior. Very nationalistic, very conservative, very fascist in, in just about every way, except that they were artists and very good ones. I mean, really, those two men are the greatest examples of fascist artists that can be found in literature in the 20th century, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I know. They're really kind of the, the outliers. Um, I think there's very few of them. Uh, I don't think fascists typically become good artists. <laughs> That's kind of a joke for Hitler. Oh, -ha. your paintings suck. <laughs> <laughs> but, he was, but neither of these men were Nazis. They were not national socialists. They weren't, um, they weren't hyper racists, right? That wasn't their bent. Um, but in everything else, fascist, their, their, uh, their love of war, their love of, uh, uh, hierarchy of, uh, of power, you know, of, um, um, the kind of transcendent nature of fighting and pain. Absolutely. A hundred percent. They were all about that. Look what happened to Mishima. But I think what happened to Mishima is, uh, is, is an appropriate demonstration of what all of that really leads to, and that is um, it, it's kind of, it kind of collapses in fantasy, right? Uh, it, it's, it's a narrative. It's an ideological spin on something that is not actually true. It's not that simple, right? Life is not that simple. And uh, you can see, I mean, Mishima couldn't even get his head cut off with the first swing from his uh, uh, second in command, unfortunately. Kind of had to kind of fuck that one up, so. Things aren't as glorious as they could have been. We'll just leave it there. Anyways, <clears throat> Bruce Sterling, the science fiction author who writes the intro for this book, calls Zapparoni a mixture of Bill Gates and Walt Disney. I'd say maybe Steve Jobs, Walt Disney, and maybe Peter Thiel. Kind of reminded me of Fritz Lang for some reason. It's probably because he's a, uh, you know, um, Captain Richards is invited to uh, uh, Zapparoni's like palatial residence, which is like, you know, this gorgeous house with like this garden outside. And, you know, it's very tastefully done on the inside. And yeah, it reminded me of like uh, uh, Fritz Lang and Contempt by Jean-Luc Godard. I don't know why. 
But then as Alex Ross alludes to in his article and uh, book review, uh, review of multiple of Jünger's books, Ernst Jünger's Narratives of Complicity, uh, great, great review, great um, discussion, Zapperoni most certainly could also have represented Hitler. Zapperoni's success has brought him immense power, dominion over the entertainment industry. Hordes of people await his annual productions. He's had a massive impact on culture. And there is something sinister to Zapperoni, something megalomaniacal, calm, calculated, grand, and invincible. In his opinion, nature was inadequate, both in its beauty and logic, and should be surpassed. There you go. This book considers the dangers of the rapid advance of technology, its integration with the natural world, and the acceptance of its almost certain, at least partial, destruction of the natural world, that is. So this soldier is invited over to Zapperoni's palatial residence for an interview of a kind, right? And it's within, you know, his large company's fortress, like, you know, surrounded by, you know, uh, we assume, like, the police or whatever. Uh, he lives inside his factory. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's quite dystopian. Excuse me, his name is Captain Richard. Today, just like Captain Richard enters Zapperoni's garden of control and surveillance in the book, we too find ourselves increasingly in that domain. Which is why I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Atlas VPN. Let me tell you about this summer deal going on at Atlas VPN, which you should definitely check out. This is the best VPN deal on the market. You can enjoy the most affordable online protection at just $1.83 a month. That's a great deal. Plus, three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. In order to keep prying eyes away from your internet activity, a VPN is essential. With this, you can stop ads and malware. You really don't want to deal with that stuff. This is more than just a VPN. It blocks all the malicious links, ads, and trackers. And, very importantly, notifies you when someone is trying to steal your data. Plus, you can unlock your favorite content from all over the world. Can't access friends or other legendary shows on your Netflix while being abroad? Not a problem anymore. Atlas VPN has got you covered. And you can get the best deals while shopping online, including online subscriptions like Netflix or Spotify, or airlines and hotels and more. And you can protect unlimited devices. Atlas VPN protects all your devices with just one subscription. And it keeps your Google searches private. With Atlas VPN, you can search the web with real and organic results and without tracking your activity. Check out the summer deal because now Atlas VPN is just $1.83 every month. Plus, three months extra with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Protect your privacy and get all those benefits of Atlas VPN for that ridiculously low price. It's cheap insurance, seriously. You get your data stolen, you get your identity stolen, you get hacked, you get malware, or whatever. You could have all sorts of problems. So don't miss out on this summer deal and grab Atlas VPN for just $1.83 every month, plus an extra three months. But be quick, as it's a limited time offer. You can get it by clicking on the link in the description box below. Please check them out. Thanks a bunch. And thank you very much to Atlas VPN for sponsoring this video. So the glass bees could be, as Ross suggests in that article, could be Jünger's imagining of what would have happened had he actually met Hitler. He almost did in the 20s but there was scheduling conflicts or something. And if Captain Richard, this uh, soldier, ex-soldier in the book, is supposed to represent Jünger, it really doesn't make him look very good, you know? Uh, and I think that would be 100% intentional. It's kind of a confessional novel in that sense. What confuses many people about Jünger is that he never chose a side. He pledged allegiance to himself and himself alone. But he was, unapologetically, very into war. The role of a warrior, of a soldier. To say he was pro-war is probably accurate, though by today's nuclear or technological standards, I imagine he would, he would say differently. But I would emphasize, above all, he was pro-soldier, right? He's kind of the David Goggins of his time. Just read On Pain. It's a, it's, a, it's a magnificent book. For him, it doesn't matter so much which side you're fighting on, right? But rather how you fight. Is it honorable or is it dishonorable? The captain talks about this personally in the book. Like, he, he, he often sides with, he often switches sides because he, he tends to side with the underdog and this can, uh, this can cause problems for him. I think that's Jünger's personal stance just coming right out of the captain's mouth. Is it honorable or dishonorable? And this is a very important and compelling distinction. Because Jünger at heart is ideologically indifferent, it seems. But he possesses a serious attitude, like decorum, in warfare. A serious ethics of combat. Ernst Jünger is an advocate for the transcendental nature of the human spirit embodied by and found within the soldier. The ability for the human spirit to overcome its fear of physical pain, to transcend itself and saving its own hide, and to perform astonishing deeds found in no other realm of human experience. And this is a guy who would know, right? He was there. He almost died. A lot. He knows what pain and death are. He's not afraid. He didn't really care about the cause or what started it when he was a young man and joined World War I. He wanted adventure, danger, and experience, right? 
and he got it in spades. In this action, he received everything he could have ever hoped for and against, and was forever changed from it, somehow living to tell the tale. I mean, he was shot in the lung. Medic comes by, puts him on the gurney, picks him up. Medic is shot, killed. Other soldier sees him, comes, grabs Younger. There's a dead medic. Slings him over his shoulder or whatever. That soldier is shot and killed. Eventually, Ernst winds up in the hospital and lives to be 102. I mean, he's got a, he's got a helmet where he's, he's showing it off in this documentary I've linked to below by Arte. Uh, he, he's, he's got this helmet he's showing off where... <laughs> what is it? He turned around to give a command. I think he was doing something with tanks. And then he turned back. Boom. Bullet comes in here. Exits over here. He's fine. Ernst Jünger was one of the luckiest men in history. I, I guarantee it. God knows how many times that man was nearly killed. I mean, there are probably only a handful of people like him who really know how easy it is to die. And uh, he must certainly have known. But it took a really long time to kill that guy. <laughs> you know what I mean? 102? Shot in the lung in his early 20s? Smoking his whole life? Dude, this guy was like hard, man. <laughs> you know what I mean? There's something astonishing and extremely powerful about war and warfare. And there's no surprise that in writing about it, he employs a kind of sexual metaphor in some of his earlier writings. Yes, he does romanticize it. Yes, it's kind of braggadocious in some areas, in his earlier writings for sure, in his much more fervently nationalist period, right? But um, I think there are other ones that are very sincere. Storm of Steel, his diaries from World War I, the book that made him famous, that made Adolf Hitler admire him greatly, is a great book. You should definitely check it out. It's not all bravado, but some of it is, for sure. Ernst Jünger studied entomology and botany after the war. One can tell these subjects were clearly of interest to him, as the protagonist of this novel studies the glass bees around Zapparoni's garden, mingling with the original ones, the natural bees. Bees are a kind of soldier. Again, drones. In the book, he begins observing the glass bees and the real bees. He realizes the glass bees and their mechanistic efficiency will suck the flowers dry, the real flowers, because, you know, these glass bees are pulling uh, nectar out of the flowers. They're competing with the natural bees, and he realizes immediately, like, they're going to be so efficient, they're going to kill the flowers. The machines are going to ruin the natural world. It will either be changed or destroyed. There's an affinity Jünger must have felt with these insects and their natural role, which is being usurped by the artificial glass bees. And Jünger, as a soldier, is being usurped gradually by technology, by the drones that we have today, right? All soldiers are being replaced with something that is unfeeling, does not look you in the eyes when it fights you, is not there championing glory or ethics or um, an unwavering belief in its own ideological convictions whether religious or nationalistic or simply competitive, it's not flesh and blood you're fighting anymore. You're not fighting men on horses with sabers. You're not dying for things that you want to die for. You're being used by large, powerful, faceless corporations, right? You know, I mean, you're being sent into the grist mill by things that have nothing to do with you, right? It's not the same. And he knew that, right? He knew that. As this Paris Review article by Jesse Yazewska Stevens mentions, in 1943, he wrote in his diary, ancient chivalry is dead. Wars are waged by technicians. Jünger was not deluded. He knew where things were going. That's what this book is, right? A very, a very quiet version of it. A lot of it is, is, is um, his memories, him, him thinking about his, uh, his, his friends and comrades in the past, and what became of them, or, or what happened, what they experienced together, how he found himself where he is, and what he did before. He never clearly spells it out, right, the war and what it was, but it seems that it was brutal, it seems that they lost, and the technological future arrived swiftly. What he seems to mourn is the loss of honor in fighting, right? The mechanization replaces what he would consider the transcendental experience. When he's forced to wait outside for Zapparoni in his garden, he makes a rather eerie, grotesque discovery that kickstarts an inner dialogue about what to do and how to escape this man. 
how to escape the garden most immediately and get out with his own skin. But in the end, he seems to rationalize it, or at least believe the, uh, the possible lie that Zabaroni's telling him. And in the end, Captain Richard opts for the kind of modus operandi of if you can't beat him, join him. Yet this victory, you know, this offer of the job that he gets in the end, is a defeat. You definitely think of Mirbeau's The Torture Garden when you read this. You, I, he must have read that. I mean, he was a fan of Baudelaire and Wiesmann and all that, so definitely, he definitely read uh, uh, The Torture Garden, which I have on the shelf. Great book. Highly recommend if you enjoyed this. Uh, it's a much more gruesome, grisly version, but it's uh, it's great. I mean, it's a it's a satire. Uh, it's it's over the top. It's like it's like fantasy, like gra like Grand Guignol. Like it's a horror story, basically. It's it's grotesque, but it's also terrific. Um, uh, by this uh, French anarchist named Octave Mirbeau, wonderful wonderful author. As Ross writes in that article. This pitch-black ending shows that Jünger offers more to the modern reader than perverse echoes of German history. The Glass Bees captures with uncommon precision the psychology of acquiescence and abjection on which the sickening miracles of technology depend. The Venus flytraps of social media are a case in point. So is the heedless embrace of artificial intelligence. Richard spells out the moral, and this is from the book, human perfection and technical perfection are incompatible. If we strive for one, we must sacrifice the other. In the end, the technical almost inevitably wins out over the human. Why? Probably money. Let's face it. So I've called Ernst Jünger a Nazi before, and I've learned that that is actually technically incorrect. So, my apologies. A member of the far-right National Socialist German Workers' Party. Okay. I thought this because Jünger was a captain in the Wehrmacht in occupied Paris. He was wearing the uniform with the eagle and swastika. I mean, it was basically like if it looks like a duck, right? That whole thing. But I also mentioned, and always knew, that it really wasn't his thing. And so I feel we need to really point this out in detail, because it's confusing, but important. Jünger was part of the German military and very loyal to his country. He was famous after writing a memoir from World War I called In Stagewitten, In the Storm of Steel, which was brilliant. An amazing book. I reviewed it years back. Another great one of his was a short one called uh, On Pain. Hitler, who was also in World War I, was a big fan of his, but the admiration was not reciprocated. Jünger did not admire Hitler. As it says in this article on Slate, though he never gave his full allegiance to the Nazis, he was glad to accept military rank in the Wehrmacht and wrote approvingly about the invasion of France, in which he accompanied one of the forward units. But I, I don't think he learned about the camps until later in 1944. By then he was embarrassed and disgusted. In 1939 he wrote a blatant criticism of uh, the Nazi party and Hitler in a book called uh, On the Marble Cliffs, which I haven't read yet but I look forward to. So he was there, he was with them. And I know this doesn't seem like an important distinction, but I do think it is an important distinction, especially if we're gonna, you know, like, you know, read his work and take it seriously. To call Jünger a Nazi, and mean that in the sense of his allegiance to the Nazi party and their adherence to racism and national socialism is incorrect. And so my apologies, I was wrong. He was not a Nazi ideologically, but he was working with them. But he was also working against them. As Alex Ross said in that article, Anti-Semitism surfaces in his writings, yet Nazi race theory held no interest for him. As Kiesel points out, Jünger rejected the stab-in-the-back legend that blamed Germany's collapse in 1918 on the skullduggery of leftist Jewish politicians. He readily admitted that his country had lost to superior forces. He did write a piece in the 20s, when he was a serious nationalist, that, if you read today, we'd all agree is anti-Semitic. But Jünger's anti-Semitism was a reflection of the widespread anti-Semitism at that time. And you can even find this kind of casual, blatant anti-Semitism in something like The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway. And that's not an apology for it. It's abundantly clear that he is what many would call anti-Semitic at this time. But I feel it's very important and one has to make the distinction. According to the Arte documentary in the description below, in the trenches of history, you gotta check it out, it's really good. This was his highly nationalist phase, and he was staunchly anti-bourgeois, even though he came from the bourgeois. I mean, like, you look at interviews with Jünger, there's like nobody more bourgeois than this guy. He was staunchly anti-bourgeois and anti-democratic. His criticism at the time against Jews was the stereotype that they reinforced the establishment, right? But Jünger's anti-Semitism was not a call for racial extermination like Hitler. We gotta make that we real. That's, that's the big point. Jünger, as far as we can tell, was not on board with that. I think he actually mocked the Nazis' racial science, right? It seems he thought it was absurd, which it was, of course. And of course, you know, later on, in the early 40s, as time progressed and the camps came in, his opinion of the Nazis grew from dismissive skepticism to 
uh, clear disgust and shame. But in all fairness, in all fairness, it's certainly as difficult to call him entirely innocent as it is to call him entirely guilty. Neither is true, right? Thomas Mann accused him of writing a kind of saber rattling that helped pave the way for the Nazis because of Junger's highly nationalist bent. So was Junger a Nazi? Technically, no. A fascist? Undoubtedly. 100%. But I gotta say, to write him off as just some Nazi is to deprive yourself of a great author. Somebody who saw a lot, right? Like him or not, he's a smart guy. He was also close to people who would eventually carry out an assassination attempt on Hitler, led by Klaus von Stauffenberg. They actually invited uh, Junger to lead them, and he declined. As Ross describes in that article, that decision haunted him for the rest of his life, and is kind of the premise for this book. Junger's affiliation with him only caused him to be discharged from the military. I think Hitler personally said nothing happens to Junger, uh, which is very interesting. Then Junger's teenage son was killed in the war. I think he w he'd been overheard saying that uh, Hitler should be hanged. His punishment for that was being sent on a dangerous mission in Italy. After having been caught listening to foreign broadcasts and having a defeatist attitude towards the regime. But the shots were at the base of the skull. So Junger was never sure whether his son died in combat or was actually executed by the SS. And by that point, he was against the Nazis, but he was careful. But he made it out, along with his wife, and he lived to be 102. At first, this book seemed weak for me. It ends in a very ho-hum manner, right? But then after reading Ross's article, I began to understand that the ending, the lackluster ho-hum go-with-the-flow decision, is in fact the disturbing crux of the story. That's the point. So I'm very grateful to him for putting that out. Other principles hold good here. Today, only the person who no longer believes in a happy ending only he who has consciously renounced it is able to live. A happy century does not exist, but there are moments of happiness, and there is freedom in the moment. Now Ross ends his article with this line discussing the glass bees. When the great test of his life arrived, the warrior aesthete proved gutless, and he's referring to the moment when Ernst Jünger was invited to assassinate Hitler and declined. And the scene in the book where uh, Zapparoni offers a job to Captain Richard and he accepts is a metaphor for that, for that failure. Right? Captain Richard having seen what he has in the garden. And that may be true. But as the Stevens article says, what did it really mean to be hands-on at such a time when protest often amounted to nothing more than self-sacrifice? It isn't a question I like to ask. So sure, it's easy to call Ernst Jung a gutless poser. But if you or I were offered the opportunity to lead men to go and kill Hitler, if you knew it was a suicide mission, and you didn't have the benefit of hindsight, and he was still all-powerful dominating Western Europe, would you say yes? We like to think we'd say yes. We hope we'd say yes. The Glass Bees is not as exciting as Younger's earlier work, not as brash or explosive, but it presents us with the disturbing reflections of a man who may have realized his own limits and susceptibility to caving under the pressure to conform to a role he'd normally detest because he's been backed into a corner and has no other options. Basically, The Glass Bees is Younger's recognition of his own propensity for evil through indifference or necessity in a just following orders kind of way, which we're all at risk for, in ways we probably aren't even aware of. It's about the defeatist mentality of if you can't beat him, join him. When times get bad enough, would you join the side you'd otherwise despise? That's the question. Better than food. Check it out. So what did I dislike? Um, well, it's great, but you really have to know Junger's history in order to fully appreciate the book, I think. There are plot elements that go nowhere, and I don't think he pushed the narrative far enough. I mean, it felt like the first 200 pages of a 600-page novel of bleak futurism all about war and technology. I felt like it ended before it began, and what was stated was understated and wasn't satisfying, especially knowing what Junger is capable of as an author having read Storm of Steel. But that article by Alex Ross really changed my mind, so hats off to him and thanks for writing it. He set up some very appetizing literary possibilities with nature, technology, surveillance, total dominating control over industry, and the progress of artificial intelligence. Ernst Jünger could never have dreamed up the future we now inhabit, but he sensed it, right? He got close enough. That's why I suggest you definitely read the book. Better than food. Check it out. So you should read it. If you're into Yukio Mishima, Hemingway, and William Gibson, I highly suggest you check it out. Cool. <sighs> Coffee time. For those of you who are new, thanks very much for stopping by and watching. I take all the names of the patrons on Patreon who have donated $5 or more per video to the show. I place their names in this mason jar. And for every review I do, I pull out a name, and whoever's name I pull out is sent a hard copy of the book I'm reviewing, plus a bag of coffee, roasted by yours truly. Currently, it's from Nicaragua, and it's wonderful. If you would like to get in on that and help support the show, thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate it. You can click on the link below or go to patreon.com forward slash books better than food and donate $5 or more per video, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. If you donate a dollar or more on Patreon, you'll get access to all the cool stuff listed below. 
and international shipping is included. Cool. All right. Thank you very much to all my patrons and best of luck. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Max. Max K. Thank you very much, Max. Really appreciate it. You're going to receive The Glass Bees by Ernst Jünger, plus a bag of coffee roast by yours truly, and I hope you love both. Cheers. Please subscribe if you have not already, and hit the thumbs up if you enjoyed this, and uh, click the bell if you'd like to be notified every time a video goes live, and always remember, die reading. All right. Thanks for watching. Take care of yourselves. Have a good night. Talk to you soon. Ciao.